Doug, Steve, it's great to catch up with you at the Congress here in Barcelona. I really want to pick your brains about some of the big trends we're seeing down on the show floor. So, I mean, what's standing out to you and why is it AI? Yeah, well, that's the, that's the word. It seems as though every year there's the pervasive theme and you can't seem to walk a square foot or a square meter without running headlong into uh, an AI uh, associated theme or as I did recently in the hallway, an actual robot. So uh, it's uh, quite, the, quite the show built around AI. And uh, we're very excited here uh, to be at the show. Uh, Spirant, uh, as, as many now know, uh, just recently announced uh, an industry first related AI with uh, the industry's very first application emulation or AI workload uh, platform uh, meant to emulate uh, the underlying application workloads that you see around the artificial intelligence community as a whole, but mainly on the back end uh, processing side of uh, these networks. So, AI without question the pervasive theme. I would be remiss though if we really didn't get back to some of the fundamentals related to last year and the progression we've seen this year, especially around 5G standalone and um, you know other technologies uh, as well like ORAN and, and others. Yeah, I think Sean, that, that is two other themes that definitely are still standing out at the show. There's a lot of focus also on that next stage of 5G, the 5G standalone move and the capabilities it's going to bring and the services that it's going to enable for a lot of the operators. So there's a lot of discussion on the show floor and the monetization opportunities that that's going to bring and the momentum of the amount of operators that are going to start that upgrade process during this year. Uh, there's also 5G Advanced, uh, with the next stage of it, which we anticipate probably in, a, in two years' time coming. And there's a lot of early discussions around it and prototypes. Uh, and again, that's heavily focused on the use cases and the monetization opportunity, especially towards industry and sort of immersive use cases. And of course, OpenRAN. OpenRAN actually is everywhere this year. I think the big announcements you saw with AT&T and with Vodafone have been a real positive driver for the industry. You know, there's probably 50 or 60 uh, vendors on the show floor today demonstrating or showing open RAN solutions and again we anticipate over the next sort of probably 12 to 18 months you're going to see a lot of the testing focus move towards that real high scale high capacity interoperability and performance which is required for the larger scale commercial deployments so we probably expect to see those commercial deployments at scale probably in the next few years and I think that's a real positive sign. Well let's dig into those a, a little bit more and we'll, we'll keep with AI first Doug you know there's a lot of a lot of hype a lot of flash out there but there is some substantive conversations happening around what this means for data architecture so maybe take us through how you're thinking about that generally how Spirant's approaching it from a product perspective. Yeah no it's a good question and so where where we are really playing and quite frankly seeing most of the need from a test and measurement perspective related to AI is in the unspoken portion and that's the back end data centers physically processing these AI workloads. Everybody's obviously familiar with all the Gen AI tools out there and you know the consumerization of chat GPT and having it you know automate these functions at the consumer level what they don't realize is the back-end infrastructure required to process these AI workloads. And that's what we're really focused on as an industry is getting Ethernet right. Ethernet suddenly is, is being reborn and repackaged, uh, but in a way that requires lossless connectivity, right? And, and suddenly, you know, latency, uh, age-old KPIs like latency suddenly matter more than ever because of the sensitivity of these AI workloads. And so that's really what we're focusing on. And as I mentioned earlier, the delivery of this net new platform to emulate these AI workloads is really built and focused around sustaining and increasing and improving the performance uh, of these backend uh, data centers. So it's kind of the unspoken or the data architecture behind the scenes that's enabling all of the fancy charts, graphs, and billboards that we see all over the show this year. You know, and, and even before AI became this central point uh, when we would talk about 5G and we'd talk about disaggregated radio systems, you know, all roads lead to lab and test automation because it's a necessity. How does the logic change when you put AI in there as well? Yeah, well, it, it, it doesn't necessarily change as much as the sensitivity of increasing the velocity and again, the throughput and uh, just the processing capacity 
everything now has to work together and it has to work perfectly. Whereas if you apply this to even ORAN or 5G related technologies, there's some level of give, I would say, for you know, having a lost packet or recovering you know, a voice over IP or a, a voice over new radio call. Well, if I insert an AI workload into that environment, one packet loss could literally render the return of that AI request completely void. And so the sensitivity and the velocity of these networks uh, has now increased exponentially with the advent of AI. And then to move over to 5G, uh, Steve, you referenced the sort of looming specter of 5G advanced and then what comes next. Uh, it hasn't been much 6G out there yet, which is kind of interesting, but you all did recently put out your annual 5G Insights report. Maybe you can give us some of the takeaways. Yeah, this, this is our, our fifth year of the, the Insights reports. Um, the, the luxury as a test company is that you test for typically two reasons. You're about to commercially launch something or it's early R&D and that gives us a unique perspective of what's about to happen and what's sort of slightly further down the line. So this year's report is based on 500 global engagements last year across 150 customers. I think the key takeaway was the big focus around testing 5G standalone. We had over 30 operators last year testing out the new 5G core. I think that's a really good insight to an acceleration in the commercial launches this year. Uh, we also saw them testing out new types of services that 5G standalone would enable. Um, things like voice over new radio, but being combined with uh, video for immersive voice video services with real-time translation. So we expect to probably see those coming in the next 12 months. We also saw early testing of things like augmented reality, especially for private network use cases. The other big key area that we saw in the, uh, that's been highlighted in the report is actually around the private network side. Um, we did see a real interesting increase around uh, fixed wireless access for enterprise. So a lot of our customers have done successfully well in rolling out fixed wireless access for the consumer, um, but now we're starting to see them move that focus towards it being used also towards the enterprise environment. In that environment, it requires a higher level of SLA uh, to meet the real stringent, stringent requirements of industry. And another key area that we saw in the report was actually the early testing of non-terrestrial networks. I think this is really interesting with the uh, proliferation of low Earth orbit satellites. There's been a real interest in direct-to-device communications. And I think what we saw last year and going into this year, a lot of the testing focus is more about the art of the possible, rather than I'm testing to be uh, commercially launch something. So they're focusing on things like what performance could I achieve? How do I deal with interference? Can I get the relevant coverage? So this indicates they're at a stage where they're looking at what the real business case is for uh, direct-to-device satcoms. I think they're also aligning it to the regulatory uh, approvals that are going to be required and also where the standards are going. So what we anticipate, uh, we, we don't really expect to see voice and data services from the low Earth uh, orbit satellites to the devices probably until 26, but we do anticipate maybe later this year and into next year IoT and SMS services coming along. And of course the other last area that we thought was really interesting was around, uh, I suppose, service assurance. Um, this transition to 5G standalone and the cloud native environments is triggering a complete refresh cycle of how they actually monitor their networks for performance and quality. The old passive ways of monitoring seem to be uh, obsolete to some degree because they need to be dynamic. And we're seeing uh, more and more requirements coming in for how you can actually uh, actively monitor and test the networks as these changes and configurations are happening when you maybe spin up a network slice. And we're also seeing more and more requirements for even over-the-air testing uh, in the field, because especially if you're deploying out a 5G standalone network into a private environment, uh, it's not only just monitoring that the network's performing, you need to understand that the device and the service that the device is getting the relevant performance. So we're seeing these sort of changes coming in as a lot of our operators look to monetize 5G as they move to standalone, both in the consumer, but also in the enterprise and private environments. And then on Open RAN, it's been a, a long road, but you referenced some very significant announcements that we've heard from AT&T and from Vodafone. So maybe help me to kind of take stock of the industry and where do you think that will go in the next few years? Yeah, I think what we saw interesting last year was, you know, from a test perspective, this sea change of moving from requirements to test what I would call for trials and pilots. So minimal sort of testing to prove that a few vendors could work together and you can get a pilot up and running or a trial up and running. We started to see some of the bigger service providers starting to demand 
what we call the non-functional testing, the real testing that has to be done to demonstrate that I could actually deploy at scale. And we're seeing those requirements coming in this year as well. So that's the things looking at the interoperability at scale, performance, resilience, security, life cycle management, all the things that the operations teams are going to require. I think that's a good indicator that they're getting prepared to not only select some of these open RAN vendors, but deploy them beyond just a few sites. So I think that's the number one takeaway. I think the, the number two takeaway that we've started to see as well is how they're going to start. Um, there is still a little bit of a mix in the market, but I think there is a common understanding at the moment that probably a requirement around a minimal viable profile, and that may be single vendor to start with, to actually get them comfortable with the infrastructure, and then they may add additional, say, radio units or distributed units later in the future. And that's what we're seeing, by the way, with the 5G core network uh, highlighted in our report. You know, most of the initial 5G core deployments, while tested for multi-vendor, they start with single vendor and they'll gradually progress to multi-vendor when they get more comfortable with the operational process. So we do anticipate probably again, sort of the second half of this decade, you will see large scale uh, open RAN deployments. And I, and I think the, the movements by not only AT&T, but others is a good sign of that. And in fact, here at the show, um, you know, we, we work very closely with NTT Docomo as part of their OREX program, where we're in the, an independent uh, test house, helping them try to commercialize these minimal viable profiles that could be used for various different deployment scenarios. And we think that's probably the way ahead. Yeah, so there's a lot of exciting discussions happening down on the show floor, and there's really a lot of energy this year. It's quite refreshing, but for our carry audience, maybe you could leave us with some summary thoughts that kind of package all this up and give us a little instruction on what to expect, Doug. Yeah, no, it's, I, I, I think it's, uh, I'll go back to a comment I made earlier around increased velocity. So if you think about, you know, 5G was one of the themes last year as an example, and you know, Steve's articulated, you know, the, the move and push to standalone 5G. The industry as a whole is still in search of that killer application that's going to drive that velocity to mass or scale adoption uh, that we haven't seen to date, whether it be fixed wireless access, voice over new radio, right? All these edge-based services, there just hasn't been that magic trick. But now when we see AI being brought into the mix and you think about that, from a backhaul perspective in the AI workloads in conjunction with all those edge-based services, it really does feel like the tipping point for 5G standalone, now accelerating to the levels that quite frankly we expected two years ago. It almost seems oxymoron to say we're early days 5G standalone, but here we are still today, early days 5G standalone. So that's kind of my central thought is it really does feel like we're now at that inflection point at the industry with so many services, so many new applications that we have to, as an industry, get 5G standalone delivered and operating at scale if we're to take advantage of all these fancy services and AI initiatives that we see everywhere. Well, I think that's really well said and it's always a pleasure to catch up with you and understand how Spirant's looking at all of this at once. So thank you guys for the time. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Sean.